For those of you joining us live, the number of you uh, at home and joining us on the replay, thank you for sharing your time with us today uh, and joining us for our Back to School, Back to Basic video series. My name is Jeff Hunter. I'm a portfolio manager with the Townsend Samani Hunter Group at Canaccord Genuity. Also on the line is our lead investment advisors, Dave Townsend and Raheem Samani. For more information about our team, please check us out on the web at www.mywealthmanager.ca. Today's call is with Tim Ng of Edgepoint Wealth. He'll be guiding us through uh, the risk and opportunities in today's markets, some of the price locations caused by COVID, and opportunities and ways to take advantage of the volatility. Before we get started, a couple of housekeeping items. We have muted participants, but in the chat below, please feel free to direct any questions to Dave, Raheem, or myself, and we'd be happy to ask on your behalf. Today's call will be recorded, so make sure to check your emails in the coming days for the replay information. Or you can follow our Facebook page at facebook.com slash mywealthmanager.ca. With that, let's start it. Or with that said, let's get started. I'll hand it over to Tim. Good morning and good afternoon, everybody. Um, hope everyone's having a good day. And I appreciate the um, Jeff, Dave, and Raheem for inviting me to speak. And over the next call, 30 minutes, I mean, I'll, what I want to do is just give you some thoughts and insights on what we see that's developed in the markets. And none of, and none of these are advice to, for, for you to act upon. It's really, you know, you, you do work with, hopefully you do work with the professional investment advisors like Raheem, Dave, and Jeff. So it's really just observations that we're seeing. And it's things that kind of pique our interest and get us worried and get us interested. So with that, let me share my screen with you guys. And as we go through this, feel free to just ask questions as we go, and I'd be more than happy to answer them. So I think it's important in the first slide to really go over, um, you know, what the next what the next 30 minutes will be. It's, we'll talk about the next 10 years. Uh, give a, a few fun thoughts on what the current events are. Uh, get back to basics and the, the price to earnings, and then talk about risks and opportunities in the marketplace. So if you talk about the, the next 10 years, and I, I believe this is important to kind of bring to, bring to light because if you look at where we are today relative to the last decade, things are materially different. Uh, returns have been relatively robust since let's call it the financial crisis. And that's really because we came from a, a pretty low base after the sell-off. But if you look at today's environment, things are materially different. So you've got parts of the market, AKA interest rates are essentially zero. So if you're parking cash, you're not getting paid for it, unlike 10 years ago, even 20 years ago. Uh, you've got government bonds yielding anywhere from, call it 59 basis points, just over 2%. So again, that is, in our minds, not that attractive. And then in certain places in, in the world, uh, real estate cap rates aren't that attractive as well, call it sub 4%. And then we're, what we're going to focus a lot of our time on today is the equity markets where we believe there's parts of the market that are very expensive based on historical levels. So, so again, uh, the backdrop does sound a little grim, but we believe over the next 10 years, returns are not, are not going to be in a double digit range. It should probably more be in the mid to sing, mid single digit range. But the positive coming out of this is because interest rates are essentially zero, uh, most people will look at equities as the best option to, to create wealth over the next decade. So that we believe that's a very positive for the equity markets over the next, you know, foreseeable future. So if you look at rates, you know, rates, like I mentioned earlier, we're essentially at zero and think zero in the States, 25 basis points in Canada. Uh, why, if you look at this trend, it's been around, it's been going down for essentially the last 30 years and it came down another 1% earlier this year. And that was really because of COVID. Uh, we don't know where rates are going to go, but, you know, in our minds, at some point, rates will have to rise. And the Fed recently said they're going to keep rates low until inflation uh, stabilizes around 2%. If you, look, if you think about that, um, in the history of time, every time where there's been a large amount of money that's being printed and a stimulus that's being injected into the economies, that's ultimately at some point ended up in some sort of inflationary pressure. So, we don't know when, we don't know how big, but you know, that is something definitely to keep an eye on going forward. So in our minds, the long-term trend of interest rates should be higher. They probably won't be excessively higher. Like, you know, if we're going to throw, I mean, I'm going to say we're probably not going to see 
high single digit rates anytime in definitely probably my lifetime, but you know, eat, but from starting at zero and going into one, one percent or two percent is a material move uh, for fixed income investors. So given that rates are zero, so you know, one of the gut reactions for investors is to say, you know what, there's just too much stuff going gone in terms of headline news these days. We've got COVID that happened during March and it's still around. We've got US elections coming in the fall. Uh, there's you know, China US tensions in terms of trade wars. So lots of things that you can make you worry. So you know, one of the gut reactions is to go to cash. Given the fact that you're not making any money in cash, you know, that the previous chart showed that you know, 30 day GIC rates are 59 basis points. You can see inflation rates here to the end of 2019 on certain areas like home prices, university tuition, public transportation, et cetera, et cetera. You can see that on the far right side, the overall inflation rate is 1.88%. So sitting in cash in our minds doesn't make sense if you're going poor by the day given inflation. And you know, I'm one of the people that never understands how inflation is being calculated because things that I buy typically go up more than 1.88% a year. So let's uh, touch base a little bit of the U.S. elections, and that's obviously the big one coming up on November 3rd this year. Um, I'm not here to make a prediction, um, you know, because if, if you think about what happened in 2016, most people predicted Hillary to beat Donald, and that didn't happen. And then when uh, President Trump won the election, most people thought the market was going to fall dramatically. And if people that have been, that were watching the market the night of the election back in 2016, you saw futures fall 4%. But only there's only but for only the next day the remaining seven weeks of the year to rocket straight up so you know in our minds whoever depending who wins the election it'll change could change things uh, slightly but it also doesn't just depend on the on the presidential seat it'll depend on who controls the house and the senate so if you look at back at the midterms in 2018 uh, when the democrats won the house the market actually was very happy because Given the, that the Democrats control the House, the Republicans control the Senate, essentially means nothing will really get done. So uh, we'll see how things play out. So, you know, you know who knows? Um, you know, just if you look at historically speaking, how elections are won and lost typically in the U.S. Of the 50 states, essentially almost 45 of them don't really matter. And, and you know, if you look at it, for example, the East and West Coast are essentially always all Democrats. So it's a blue state. The center of the country is typically all red states Republicans. Essentially, any election is essentially won through about six states. So you can look at the states like Florida and what they call the Rust Belt states. So the states that kind of surround the Great Lakes. So that would be Michigan, Ohio, Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, things like that. So, you know, if you are, you know, astute to watching the, the election, those are kind of the states to look for that will swing the elections because it, it won't be California, it won't be New York, it won't be Texas. Um, but it, in our minds, um, you know, if you think about it, President Trump has been pro-business, which is positive for the economy. Uh, but obviously, he's you know, he has his, his different ways of doing things. You know, pre, you know, candidate Biden. We'll see how he plays out in terms of uh, how he sits. But if you look at you know, based on Democrats, he's more of a moderate than a, than than other candidates in the past. So, um, but I think the key is. You're probably going to see volatility leading up to the election just because people don't know. Uh, but it, it'll be interesting to see how this, who wins as well as the, who controls the House and the Senate. Given that, I think, I believe most people on this call are based in Alberta. I think it's, you know, you know important to really touch upon oil because that's always been an issue for uh, you guys in Alberta. And in our minds, you know, we're not oil bulls, but in our mind, stats have been telling us that oil demand should still rise for the next you know, decade or two. And this chart will say, you know, global energy demand is expected to increase by 27% by 2040. So, and even though, yes, there are alternative fuels that are being developed and being used, whether it's electrical, hydrogen, wind power, and all the other, <coughs> all the other kind of energies that are out there, uh, most businesses and people still consume uh, oil and gas as a majority of their day-to-day, -day, and that we believe that's still going to be uh, 
you know, in demand over the next couple of decade or so. This chart, we're gonna go through the same thing where it just seems that transportation energy demand should rise as well as light duty fleet by, by type as well. So you can see the, the green is the, the gas and as well as the light duty vehicles and heavy duty vehicles. Any questions so far? So that's really just you know, some observations and thoughts. And again, they're not, they're not predictions and you know, please, please don't think of any predictions. There's really thoughts on what we're seeing. The next little, next section we'll get into is really what's going on in the markets, you know, what we're seeing and what are the, what are the risks out there in terms of um, you know, investing. So I decided to put this little Dilbert chart up. It says, in today's news, our company has decided to buy another dying business in a business we don't fully understand. Our stock rose five points th today on the announcement. Why does our stock go up every time we do something boneheaded? I think it's, I, I like to think it's, it's part of our competitive advantage. So in our minds, what we're seeing today is very interesting in terms of how rational the market has been in terms of some of the names and some of the areas uh, that people have been gravitating towards. So, it, so just to take a step back before I get into kind of what, what the market, I think it's really important to really go back to basics in terms of, you know, how would you choose a company if you're investing? I think the first thing is obviously you find a great business, right? You find a great business you want to invest in. And in our minds, a great business is a business that can grow their business. They can, they have a barrier to entry where they, somebody can't come steal their market share. Um, and those are pretty easy to find, to be honest. I mean, you can probably off the top of your head list about 10 businesses that you believe are fantastic that, have the barriers to entry that can grow their business over the, let's call it the next five to 10 years. But the real hard part of the equation is not finding those businesses. It's actually, what price do I actually pay for those businesses is, is the real kind of, you know, um, big question that people have a hard time grappling with. So if you look at, you know, this chart, it really just goes back to basics, right? So this says, if you have a cookie business that makes a hundred thousand dollars a year, or you want to buy one at what price makes sense? Clearly the, the, the spectrum is $1 to 10 billion. So if you're gonna buy this business, you love it to buy it for a dollar because it's giving you $100,000 a year. If you're selling it, you don't want it. You're selling it, you want to sell on the other end at 10 billion, right? So the value of the business that you see at the bottom is determined by the cash the business will put in your pocket while you own it. So that's $100,000 a year. And this is determined by the future stream of profits discounted back at the rate of return you hope to earn. So most people wanna, let's say they wanna own for rounding, let's just own, we want to own 10%. So if you look at this chart, so if you look at the earnings of that cookie company that you own, it's, it's generating a hundred thousand dollars a year in your pocket. If someone's willing to pay you $1 million for it, you're essentially priced at 10 times earnings. That seems pretty average because that's the kind of the, the return you want to make in the, in, in general. So that's your annual return. So the person buying your business though, because they're paying 10 times what this business, this business generates today, if this business doesn't grow, will take 10 years to return their money. On the other hand, if, you, you know, if you're lucky enough, you're selling your business that generates $100,000 a year and someone's willing to pay $3 million for it, you're essentially sold your business for 30 times, which in, for the seller, this is very good, but for the buyer, you're essentially, your rate of return, assuming the business does not grow is 3.3% a year, which means if the business doesn't grow, to recoup your $3 million investment on this business will take you about 30 years. So, so, that, and so that, will, that leads into kind of PE, right? So if you look at the market, why is PE important? If you find a great business, who cares what the price is? So if you look at this chart, it says entry price dictates returns. It's a little bit busy, but let me kind of explain how it works. So this chart is the S&P 500. This is return on the Y axis. This is the price on the X axis. So the further you go on the right, the more expensive it is. The further up on the Y axis you go, the more return you get. Every diamond on this chart is 10 years of the return of the market based on the year you invested. So for example, uh, let's take 1994. If you, we invested at that time with a market multiple, if you go down here, looks to be about 23, 24 times. 
uh, your return if you held that investment for 10 years, so you sold it in 2004, looked to be, yeah, let's say about 11%. So that's all these diamonds on this chart. If you look at it, if you look at this line, the dotted line, this is the median of all those diamonds. And the dotted line here, this was in 2019, so it's not as up to date, but it, it looks like the market multiple um, was about 24 times, but it's actually a little bit higher now in 2020. So if you, if you look at, generally speaking, how can you make better returns going in the long term? If you look at the market multiples when they're kind of less or more undervalued or more reasonable, so let's say anywhere from 6.7 to 12, even 14.7, look at where most of the diamonds are clustered. You'll see a, a big clustering between that 12 to 17%. So let's say it's a 15% average return over five years. And let's say when you start getting into the higher multiples, so let's say, you know, in the twenties. So you look at the twenties, you know, where are these diamonds being clustered? You're essentially, let's say, you know, let's say the clustering is around here. And so your market multiple is about seven, eight percent since you cut it in half. So that's why in our minds at edge point, we feel finding a business is, is easier than pay, finding the right price to pay that. So what that means is if you're looking at today's market multiple and let's say the market multiple is about 25 times, we go to the average line today over the next 10 years, that return looks like about eight, eight, nine percent. So high single digits. So again, back to the first point of the next 10 years, you know, we're not expecting such a double digit returns given where we're starting today in terms of the market multiple. Next slide, we'll kind of go and just go into the market observations. And this is, this is kind of some interesting stuff that we're seeing. So this is year to date. So what we've taken is we've looked at who are some of the big names that everybody wants to buy. So you've got the big six here, right? You've got Apple, Amazon, uh, Alphabet, Facebook, Microsoft, Netflix. So these are the ones that's kind of on everyone's kind of tip of their tongue when it comes to investing this year. If you look at their year to date returns, these six, if you take it out of the index of the S&P 500, have returned about 56.42%, which is outstanding. But the remaining 494 companies this year, year to date to the end of August, have returned negative 1.1, negative 0.12%, so essentially flat. In our minds, this is wild because we, I don't think we've ever seen this type of dispersion with a very handful of few stocks versus the rest of the market. And I think I've heard a stat recently from one of my colleagues saying, in the S&P 500, if the bottom 200 companies disappear tomorrow off the index and there's 300 companies left, it would move the market by less than 5%. So what that means is the top few companies are really controlling the movement of the market. So let's take a look at some of some other names. Those are not just those big six, but some names that people say, you know what, given what's going on in the world today, there are some new trends. There's some fast growing companies that we, we should be part of. So you go this slide. It says that the big grower. So it says based on earnings, based on the expectations of 22% annual gains over the next five years, these companies are known as the big growers. Oops, let me back it up. These companies are known as the big growers. So these are 75 of the fastest growing larger names in the, in the world. Uh, so these are the earnings estimates for the next five years. So you look at the names, you can see the tickers all at the bottom here. On the far left, you've got Tesla, you've got then Zoom, which we're using. You've got DocuSign, you've got Shopify, then you've got some, even the fangs in here. You've got Netflix here. You've got Amazon here, Facebook here, and Google. So these are the names that experts have projected that are going to grow on average 22% over the next five years. So we should own all these businesses. When you, when you look at how fast they're growing, which is fantastic, but then you kind of layer on at what price are we being asked to pay for it. So this chart takes a look at those big growers, those 75 names, uh, back to 1952. So every time they look at the top, the fastest 75 names, how expensive have they been? So we are now at a point where, if you see the far right, 
this is where we are. And this is the most similar period we, that's relatively, to, relatively comparing to today is 1999-2000. So if you look at the median average, big grower PE, oops, sorry. You look at the median big grower PE, it's trading about 100 times earnings. And if you look at it in history, and back to history 99-2000, uh, what was happening then, you had this new thing called the internet. Uh, everybody wanted a piece of the internet or exposed to the internet some way. Uh, there was a lot of investments into that part of it. And obviously there was a, a correction that came afterwards. So we're not calling for correction today, but what we're saying is given the growth in some of these names, the, you know, that previous chart that listed the 75, given the price that they're being asked to pay today, it's prudent to be careful in what you're picking. So that goes down to the next chart, and this chart shows, <coughs> it says historically, is the title. How have these 75 businesses, or the fastest 75, the fastest growing 75 businesses done in terms of achieving their earnings projections over the next five years? So this chart goes back to 1960. So it gives you 60 years of data. So what this chart says is only one-fifth of the big growers have actually historically accomplished this feat, meaning when you go back to this chart, of these 75 companies, only one-fifth of them or only 20% of them are actually going to hit their earnings projections over the next five years. So what that means is 80% of them aren't going to make it in terms of hitting the projections. And if their price to perfection like they are today, you can see some share price um, contraction when they miss those. So really, the takeaway in this chart is, it isn't that technology is bad or the fastest companies are bad. A large percentage aren't gonna hit their earnings projections. So the best thing to do is leave it up to professional to help you select the companies that have the best chance to maintain or achieve those earnings projections. Next chart, we'll kind of go through, well, how have these big growers done relative to the broad market? So this chart goes back to 1953, and it takes those, the 75 fastest growing companies and said, and compares how did it do versus the S&P 500? So how this chart works is you've got zero on the far left. Any bars above the zero is when those 75 fastest growing companies at the time had did better than the market. And every time when you see the bars below the zero is when those 75 companies did underperform the broader market. So if you turn your attention to the far right side of the screen, look at here, this is where we are now. So it's the, you know, obviously it looks like the 75 faster growing companies have dominated the market over the last year, year and a half. So that's true. But the real question now is where does it go from here? Where's the next few years? And in our minds, this chart, uh, tells you a different uh, tells you a pattern if you go back to the previous period that's similar to now this was 2000 during the dot-com days you had a period where those 75 companies materially did better than the broad market look at the subsequent years the subsequent years you had the broad market the S&P do better than those 75 companies now let's go back to kind of the late 80s early 90s you got another period where those collection of 75 faster growing companies did better. And then the subsequent few years, the broader market did better. And then you go back to, you know, to kind of the 1980s, late 70s, 80s, you've got a period of time where the faster growers did better and the subsequent years where the broader market did better. So you, and you can see this pattern kind of repeat itself over the last 70 years. So the takeaway on this chart is really, yes, the big growers have done well, but if, we are put, if you're putting money, new money to work today or you're rebalancing the portfolio by taking profits today, where should the money go? And you know, I, I, you know, I think you can see the, the clear pattern there. Now this chart so, you know, will kind of remind people that may not have remembered or don't want to remember the dot-com bubble in 2000. So if you think about back then, what was going on and what was the investment thesis? What was going on is this new thing called the internet started. People thought it was kind of interesting. They thought it can transform society. And they said, okay, if this is revolutionary, if this was gonna transform society, we need to have a piece of, we need to invest 
part of our money into the space. So you look at March of 2000, the, we, we, we put together a collection of these companies that were, ex were exposed to the technology space back then. And these are real businesses. We didn't put names like, you know, JDS Uniphase and Nortel and Red Hat that went to zero. These are businesses back then. They're still amazing businesses today. If you look at their average PE back in 2000 on March 10th, it was 95.66 times. Actually, it's very similar to the chart, one of the charts I showed you earlier where the median big grower PE is about 100 times. So relative to the market, the S&P was about 27.85, which is higher than long-term averages, but it wasn't the 95.66. When the stock market crashed in 2000, started on March 10, 2000, it ended 2002, what you see here is the drawdown of these more expensive names was down 71% and the broad market was down 44. So they're both down, but the, the more expensive names went down more and the recovery time was the interesting part of it. The recovery of the S and P was four years. The recovery on some of these names varied from 4.6 years to haven't recovered to the previous highs in terms of Cisco. So the question we ask at our firm is, even though it's a great company, is it a great investment because of the price? So you look at one of the names on this chart, this chart I'll highlight is Microsoft. I think if you pull 10 people in this, in the, in anywhere, they'll say Microsoft's a fantastic business, it's a great stock, you know, everyone's made a lot of money on it. If you go back to 2000, when it was trading at 63 times earnings, when the market crashed, it essentially took 13 years for an investor to recover their money to break even. But obviously now Microsoft stock is trading at $180 a share. But in our minds, the average retail investor was probably not gonna stick around for 13 years to break even in order to reap the benefits of the last, call it 10 years. But again, there's a sign, there, there's a exa classic example that, that Microsoft, fantastic world-class company, but when, you, when it was purchased at the wrong price in 2000, um, people had to wait 13 years to break even. So that's kind of the faster growing companies out there. And those are the ones that, have, you know, the sexy names that everybody wants to be invested in. The other part of the market where we feel there's excessive valuation or high valuation is also what they call the safety names. So low beta names or safety names. So, and these are be, probably because of COVID, right? COVID started, uh, late December in Asia, it's, it, it's spread around the world. And, um, you know, to this day, you know, we don't, no one knows when it's going to be over, meaning on the other side of COVID, uh, we, it could be here for an extended period of time. So, but when COVID really started to hit in mid-March of this year, that created a lot of uncertainty. So most retail investors said, if there's uncertainty and we don't know how bad COVID will be, we don't know how long COVID is going to last, I need to park my money somewhere that gives me certainty. So they drive by the grocery store or Costco. There's massive lineups, so I'm gonna buy Costco. You know, uh, for people like me, I have uh, small young kids. Um, I have to buy diapers, so you know, investing my money in J Johnson & Johnson. I, you know, I still brush my teeth every day, so I'm gonna buy toothpaste from a company like Procter & Gamble. These are fantastic world-class businesses, but at this point, you look at their historical valuations, this is since 1952, they're trading on the higher end of their valuation. So these businesses don't really grow their business that, that well, but they're trading at historically high levels. And if you go back to you know, when this happened, one of the previous times you have 1973, 74. So for the people that remember 73, 74, what happened, you had peak oil, uh, you had a market correction in 73, 74, but people said, listen, no matter what happens in the, mar in the world, if you own the 50 largest companies, the nifty 50 as they're called, you're, you'll be fine, you'll, you'll do okay, you'll make money. So if you look at the not so nifty 50 chart here, we take some of, the, some of those businesses that were world-class back then, and what's interesting, look at some of these names. You've got International Flavors and Fragrances, Disney, Coke, Amex, you know, IBM, GE, McDonald's. These back 50 years ago was viewed as some of the 50 best companies. And today they're viewed as some of the best 50 companies. So um, they're a powerhouse company, but in 1970 through 72, if you purchase this collection 
the average PE was 47.96 versus the market of 19.2. And if you look at the, after the stock market correction of 73.74, the recovery time on average was 11.4 years, essentially a decade versus the market of 6.1. So as you know, the, for some, the 70s was known also as the last decade where essentially you put money in the market in 71, by 81, you didn't really make any money. So again, the, the, the message is, whether it's fast growing, whether it's a mature business, even if it's a world-class business, price dictates returns. So in our minds at Edgepoint, you know, you know we're ta- we're creating, I've created a backdrop where you know, it doesn't make sense to invest in GICs or bonds because re- where rates are, there's expensive parts of the equity market. How do you get exposed to some of these areas at, at a better valuation? And please, these are none of these names or recommendations to buy. It's really a, for an example. So if you look at this slide, it's a second level thinking. And if you look at it, you've got the, the left column says what the idea is, what the theme is. So you've got things like you know, e-commerce, electric cars, 5G, payments, blah, blah, blah. Second column is first level thinking. So this is the gut reaction for the, inve- for the, for the average investor to say, if based on this, I- this idea or this theme, what is the obvious company to invest, company to invest in? So you, let's take e-commerce. So e-commerce, that's a big topic of discussion these days because with COVID lockdown, none of, none of us had to be able to go out. So we, in- we essentially bought all our stuff online. Obviously the dominant player is Amazon. We believe it's a fantastic business run by a fantastic CEO, but when it, at the current valuation, our, our question that we have is, is it a great investment for the next five or 10 years? So rather than invest in an Amazon, what we do at Edgepoint, we invest in a company called Element Fleet. What is it, and you ask, what does Element Fleet have to do with Amazon and e-commerce? So if you think about when you buy a package off Amazon, it gets shipped to call it, a, eventually to your local distribution center warehouse. So in, I'm in Vancouver, so ours is in, by the airport here. Once it gets to that warehouse, that package gets put onto a delivery truck, whether it's a, car, a delivery vehicle. That, every one of Amazon's delivery vehicles are managed by Element Fleet. So therefore we have, in, we have exposure to e-commerce in an indirect way. So every time someone buys a package from, from Amazon, we benefit from it because it will get delivered to their doorstep by one of the trucks that's managed by Element Fleet. You look at electric cars, another hot topic, right? So the obviously the top of mind company you think about is Tesla, right? I gotta own Tesla if, if electric cars are gonna dominate the world. We don't own Tesla, just again, one of the reasons is valuation. Rather than owning Tesla, we said, okay, how do we capture the growth in electric cars and we actually broaden it out we say not even just electric cars how do we capture the growth in the electronification of cars so we instead of owning tesla we said okay let's own t connectivity and why because if t connectivity is the global leader in terms of providing sensors and connectors to things like cars so whether it's electric whether it's combustible engine cars uh, think about at the in the future if we ever go to driverless cars how many sensors will be needed on those vehicles? So, and if you know, I'm going to pose the question. You think about it. Um, if if you have you or anybody you know have purchased a car in the last let's say three years or even five years, compared to the car that you or they had previous to that, how many more sensors on that car do you have? A lot. Right? If you think about it, I had a coffee with a friend of mine the other day. And he said to me, he goes, hey, my neighbor bought that new uh, Tesla Y, that crossover. I said, oh, great. He goes, he goes there, are, there are now 12 sensors around this new Tesla Y. Compared to the older Tesla, which is one of the ones is the Model X with the, the doors that swing out, those had about six sensors. So you essentially double the number of sensors on the new Tesla. So if you think about it, we don't need to bet on Tesla to win given the valuations at that levels. Rather, we invest in TE connectivity that gives us exposure to the electronification of cars. So you can go down through all these different areas and you know, I won't go through any more unless you guys want me to, but the takeaway is when you have these, whatever the big idea is, the first level thinking typically 
to get exposure will cost you a little bit more at 36 times. For us at Edgepoint, because we believe entry price dictates returns, we look at trying to have the similar exposure in a different way. Typically, we get it at a, bit, a much, much more attractive valuation. So in closing, that's really what I had kind of on the book. So I'm going to kind of throw it out there to uh, Jeff, Raheem, and Dave to see if there's any, they have any questions or any of you guys have any questions. Just kind of before we get started, there's a chat bar at the bottom of your Zoom that you're more than welcome to direct either private or publicly any of your questions, more than happy to ask on your behalf. Uh, first one's coming in, in that uh, while the U.S. is extremely expensive, as, as you're mentioning, global companies are trading at a record discount. You're seeing about 20, a little bit over 24 in the U.S. right now versus about 17 globally. Um, and given the flexibility of investors nowadays, what are your views on positioning and, and where you're looking? Um, I see, obviously, uh, is it Barty? Um, in India and there's a couple other ones out there. Is it, are you finding more opportunities in those international companies and, and where? Yeah, that's a great question. So yeah, if, if you look at, yes, I mean, if you look at on valuation, there are better other geographic areas that provide a better risk reward, but it all, but it's just not, you can't just look at valuation, right? So you look at things like, um, you know, can they complete goal? Can they compete globally? Um, if there are trade wars, do they have pricing power? So you have things, things like that. But in general, yes, you know, we have been finding some names outside of the U.S. that we feel gives us better risk reward. If you look at, uh, we have a global mandate. Uh, we've got about just over 20% of our names in the country of Japan. Um, and we've had that for about four years. And the reason being, if you look, if you think about Japanese company historically, they tend to create very good products. They treat their employees very well, but they're very terrible for shareholders. So if you own the stock, they don't care about making money. They care about making good products. They care about you know, treating their employees very well. But you're seeing since uh, Prime Minister, President Abe, Prime Minister Abe has been in power that he's been trying to influence corporate Jap Japanese companies to be more shareholder friendly. And we're starting to see that over the past bunch of years. So. You know, we own a, a Japanese cosmetic company that typically, if you look at Japanese companies like um, L'Oreal and Estee Lauder, their margins are probably closer to 13 to 15%. This Japanese cosmetic company, their margins, uh, I call it five years ago, was probably 3 to 4% because it was run like a Japanese company. Didn't care about profits. But what they did was they brought in a new CEO that is a Japanese national, but he was educated and trained in, the, in North America. So he had the North, North, Amer North American way of thinking. So he went back to Japan running this Japanese cosmetic company and started to change the culture of the company to be shareholder friendly. And you've, we've seen their margins essentially double from where they were at three to 4% to approximately seven, 8%. And based on where a typical global cosmetic company is, which is call it closer to the mid-teens, we believe there's runway left. So there's an example of, one example of the Japanese culture is starting to shift. So because for decades and decades, they didn't care about making money, people shied away from Japan, which caused, uh, created interesting valuations. Just uh, another one out there. Uh, what percentage of cash equivalent holdings are recommended because of the volatility due to COVID? And just to, for me to add on that, and, and how do you use your volatility? How do you use the volatility uh, to enhance gains over the longer run? Yeah, I think that's I think that's a two like it's a, essentially a two level question for so for the average investor. I mean, cash is something that it's probably best answered by like Jeff Raheem and Dave. Like it, it depends on your personal situation, right? I mean, it depends on uh, your age, your risk tolerance, your time horizon, your your your, your expenses and things like that. So, um, you know, so it's, it's not, you know, there is no set number in terms of the average investor. Right. But, you know, but in terms of, uh, on our level, on the portfolio level there, we tend to run not, we tend to not use cash as a tactical tool, meaning 
saying, hey, we don't like the market because of COVID. We don't like the market because there's a U there's election coming in the fall. We're going to go to 30% cash and wait till uh, that, ha that event happens and then we'll, we'll decide then. For us, that's more like market timing and we just, we're just not good at that. And if you think about the markets today relative to 20, 30 years or even 10 years ago, how, how much faster and vi more violent does the market move these days, right? And for lots of reasons, right? Whether it's high frequency, high frequency trading, whether it's ETFs, whether it's whatever. So if the, 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 free, the, the speed and, the, and the, the violence of the moves today in the market are much more than before, we just don't think we're good at much time in the market. So what we try to do at our firm is we, we invest in a, a small collection of companies, about 30 odd companies. We say, you know, we try to determine the value of the business and say, Hey, we believe the value of the business is $10. Let's say a share. If the stock price is trading down below that, then we say, okay, it's probably a good time to, to buy some more of these shares. If it's trading above that, we'll sell it. So typically, um, you know, that's what we do. And, but for us, on average, we believe 5% is fully invested for us. So it, like anything, you want to keep money aside for a rainy day. So being 0% cash doesn't make sense. Uh, for us, five is probably makes sense, but we've gone as high as 17. When we were trimming names, we've gone as low as 1%. But on average, five on our level makes sense. But on a retail level, again, I think it has to come down to each and everyone's personal situation. That's determined between you and Jeff Raheem and Dave. Another one here, Tim. Um, what do you see the impacts? Uh, what do you see as the impacts of super majors like Shell and BP switching over to an overall energy portfolio as opposed to only developing oil and gas? Uh, I, I mean, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not an oil and gas guy. Um, so I'm, I'm probably not the one to ask. So we have exposure to some oil and gas names, which, you know, but I mean, I'm, I'm going to have to pass on that, but I think, um, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm going to give you something that I, that's going to be a wild guess. Uh, question, uh, Tim, and a great presentation. Uh, really hammering the fact that uh, investing is more of a uh, intelligent approach, not a shotgun approach. Um, I think you are starting to sense clients getting mesmerized by technology, healthcare, and a lot of the IPOs coming out are, are almost shotgun approach oriented. Uh, clients don't understand their business models. They're seeing a lot of momentum trading. Uh, but one question that uh, comes to me quite a bit, because I'm a, I'm a big time value investor and I like buying big companies that I think can grow over time. Uh, and this is a lot of value based uh, managers have been asked is are we starting to incorporate an allocation towards gold or precious metals uh, in the debasement of currencies and printing uh, as, as a hedge in the portfolio? Uh, there's a lot of thoughts around this. So Warren Buffett uh, probably maybe as a portfolio position, a small one, um, they're looking at cash flow. Um, but any thoughts that the edge point has on an allocation to precious metals or a value-oriented precious metal company. Yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, if if you go back, um, you know, in history of time, when you have this type of you know stimulus that's in the market and inflationary pressures, I mean, you know, gold is definitely one of the beneficiaries of that, and we've seen it recently. We've seen gold price run to you know, per, you know new levels. Um, you know, in our we run a Canadian mandate that we do have gold exposure. In our minds, uh, investing in resources, whether it's precious metals or oil and gas, is is unique. Where it's a cyclical business, right, or a cyclical sector. So, in our minds, how we would tend to like to invest in these areas, I look for businesses that have stronger balance sheets. So, you know, as you know, with some of these resource companies and precious metals companies, given de depending what they do, sometimes their balance sheets are have some uh, good amount of lever debt on them because as these, as the commodity prices move up and down, when they go down, you need to come, we would like a company to be able to survive that downturn and actually come out stronger. So you'd want to look at companies that have you know, less debt. So the companies that we own typically in that space are some of the royalty companies and the golds 
uh, even in the oil and gas, we own a bunch of the, the royalty companies and the kind of the, the service companies and less the actual producers. But in, in high, you know, but on a big picture, yeah, I mean, if we get into an inflationary environment at some point, gold will probably be, in, uh, in what could make sense as part of a port allocation in our portfolio. Quick, perfect. Quick. And uh, one last question, um, expansion in corporate credit uh, and how large companies now are issuing debt at, uh, at levels that are considered almost T-bill in nature. Apple from Google uh, can issue corporate debt globally at 0.45%. Uh, and this is probably going to help create the euphoric effect of large multinational cash flowing corporations can get bigger uh, on the whim, uh, and you know, what are your thoughts with some of the companies that you have selected in the portfolio? Uh, are they going to be the same types of companies that can expand and take advantage of corporate credit and the real thirst for yield, especially from a position of pension plans and uh, family-oriented offices that require allocations mandated for fixed income? Yeah, that's a great question. So if you look at it, like, why wouldn't you, right? Like if, if you, if, if you, if you personally speaking, like if, if every one of us could let, can, you know, um, you know, lend someone, you know, get paid, get, get charged, you know, less than 1% to borrow money. And then we take it and we invest it. Oh, let's make it make more than that. Like anybody would do it. Right. So I think in a lot of companies, it makes sense for them, but it, it depends on the business in terms of, you know, if we get rates moving or not, if when rates start moving up and we don't know when and we don't know how fast or how high, but if they have a, a, a large amount of debt and rates trend upwards, can they, can they maintain that debt without compromising their free cash flow, right? So uh, if you're in a business that generates lots of free cash flow, if there's targeted acquisitions or targeted growth that you want to do, issuing debt, we believe makes sense, right? But it has, they have to have the free cash flow be able to Call what they call deleverage pretty fast afterwards, right? But if you're a company that already has a lot of debt and they're just refinancing that debt because at a cheaper level, it'll help probably in the short term. But if rates rise, but when rates rise back up at some point, it's probably going to be a drag on them as well, right? So I think it's a you know company by company by company specific situation where it can be used as an interesting tool, right? If you look at, I think there was a, there was a question online. It says, do you utilize short positions? And what is the balance of U.S. equities versus world and Canadian? Uh, in our in our toolbox, we can use short positions, but we don't, or we haven't actually. We've been around for about almost 13 years. We haven't in our 13 year history. And, and it's not a right or wrong answer. Um, in our in our experience, how short positions work, you know, I mean, if you look at long positions, you really have two really have two questions you got to ask yourself. What is the value of the business that you want to buy? And are you buying it under, at the right price? And then you, hold, you buy it and you invest in it for, let's say, five, 10 years. And hopefully at some point in the future, that, that, uh, that value is realized. But if you look at it, when you do short positions, you, there's a third question that has to be answered. You have to determine the value of the business that you want to short, um, the, value, the, the price that you want to short it at, and you have to be with pretty high certainty when that price is going to achieve, that short price is going to be achieved, and whether it's three months, six months, a year out. And in our minds, we can't predict when stock prices go up. We can't predict when stock prices go down. So it's, for us, we just think it's, a, it's another variable and probably the, more ver the hardest to kind of pin down in terms of given you have to have a high conviction with a certain amount of time frame as your shorting positions because there's a cost to it. So that's the question on the shorts. I mean, again, it's not a right or wrong, just some people are, are good at it. We just don't believe we have it. We think it's harder to do than just being pure long. Uh, what is the balance of U.S. equities versus world? So if you look at, if you look at our, one, our global mandate, we're probably running about a 45% U.S. listed businesses. We're probably running in the low 20s Japanese businesses. Uh, we're probably running high teens in the European businesses. Uh, we've got about 5% in Canada. Uh, we've got about just about 2.5%, 3% in India. 
And that's kind of the makeup of the, the geographic composition. But, but just to remind people, I mean, given the globalization of things, I mean, we don't believe geographic allocations even matter. I mean, if you look at some of the businesses out there, the big multinationals, they'll, they sell their products around the world. So really for, for us, geographic composition is more of a byproduct of us finding, going around the world and trying to find the best businesses. And we believe that's the best way to look at it. Just uh, when you guys ran Trimark, uh, and, and going back to those years, uh, and you talk about the high valuation years, so just the, the tech bubble um, that we had there, uh, you guys were able to return a lot or have really good returns going forward. Um, obviously, there was some catch up you had to play first, just given how aggressive those companies grew in terms of price appreciation. Um, when you look at a scenario now and you see a little bit of the split, especially with the at home stocks. And like you said, the safe, safe, stable names. And you look at valuations, is there a real big pocket of the market that's just been completely neglected where you could have those bigger names be volatile and create that volatility, but still have tremendous amount of gains going forward uh, because they just, they haven't been looked at. And then they haven't been the place to play in the last decade. Yeah. And I mean, that's, that leads into, you know, what's been happening in the market. You, you think about the market and we've seen charts where it shows what they call an unbalanced market or bifurcated market where um, you know, the, let's say the S and P the, the, the 1500 names in the U S the top 300 essentially are driving all the returns. And I showed you, and I can show that six ponies, one trick where, you know, year to date, the, the top six gains are up 56% and the, the rest of the market's flat. So, yeah, I mean, you look at it. I mean, there is massive, massive hurting into one er in a few areas, which creates a lot of opportunities for uh, other parts of the market. So in a, in a diversified portfolio, and we're not saying you don't have exposure to those big growing areas, but we're, so we're saying in a diversified portfolio, you want to have, ex you want to have exposure to the areas that, uh, aren't in those big growers or those safety names because again, when this market turns, it's not if it's always going to be when there may not be a signal. Um, and it, given how fast and violent the market's been moving recently, uh, it's it could turn relatively fast. Like you think about, um, you know, March 23rd, like who thought March 23rd or March 22nd that March 23rd would be the bottom of the market, right? I mean, there's so much fear in the market because of COVID. You look at, you know, back to even, you know, um, you know, December, 2018, right? If you think back then what was happening yet, U S tried to raise interest rates that didn't work. There was the escalation of U S China trade relations market sold off essentially from October to, to Christmas Eve. And most of us were on holidays and no one realized that the market bottomed on Christmas Eve. Right. So, um, and so those are situations where, again, it's, the big growers aren't, some are fantastic businesses. And again, you can have exposure there, but make sure you've got exposure somewhere else as well. Raheem, Dave, anything else to touch on or anyone else in the audience want to uh, have a couple questions that they need to answer before we get up and tidy up here? I think that that's it for now. Uh, Tim, I really appreciate it. Uh, as we talked about in, in our monthly views in September, September and October usually create tremendous opportunities to, to add capital to the equity markets, as, whether it be people coming off holidays and, and getting into quote unquote stress timber. Uh, you really want to utilize that to, to buy those businesses, invest in those strategies that uh, might even present themselves at a cheaper opportunity. If you have any questions, feel free to reach out to Dave, Raheem, or myself. Uh, Tim, uh, from all of us here, thanks very much for your time. And thank you everyone else for joining us and sharing uh, your lunch hour with us. Yeah. Thanks very thank, much, Tim. Great thank presentation. You. Thank you very much, everybody. Like, stay, stay safe thanks, and uh, we'll talk again sometime. Thanks a lot.